good afternoon, everyone. Um, my name is Joris Verbauer. I'll be hosting the uh, Gentwer Group webinar today from Brussels in Belgium. So I am the uh, product support manager for Color at Kodak, working on products like Kodak Colorflow, Spotless, and the proofing solution. And the title of this uh, webinar is Color Management, fun for designers and print buyers. So um, I'll hope that um, there'll be uh, topics covered here that you can learn uh, regarding color flow, uh, the color management, the uh, impact it has on your design, and more why you would uh, want to have all this color management going, right? So the reason behind all this. So a few weeks ago, a colleague of mine, he was at one of the Codex users conferences in New Orleans, and um, he was actually trying to find a coffee. So he was uh, looking around, he did a Google search, and he found Starbucks coffee really uh, right next door. When he went there, when he was uh, going to the place where he was supposed to be, he, he, he couldn't really find it. He was uh, looking around, couldn't really find it, had another close look and then, well, finally he discovered it, but he was actually tucked away somewhere in a corner uh, of the uh, of the hotel and uh, he couldn't really find it. So what is missing here? What is the, the reason he couldn't find it? Right, so the the real uh, brand color, the logo from uh, Starbucks coffee was missing. It's the green colored um, logo, it's the color scheme. And probably the um, the owner of the uh, the place there had good reasons to uh, integrate the coffee, uh, the coffee bar really uh, well into his hotel environment. So there was restrictions for the color scheme, but still for Starbucks coffee, it didn't really work so well because their clear indication, their brand color wasn't showing up so well. If you would go uh, many different places anywhere in the world and you uh, try to find a certain brand, you'll instantly be reminded of the brand just by seeing the color, not just the logo, but the color is, is really essential to this. Um, if I show you this here, instantly you will think about Kodak, uh, even if you don't really see the logo or the words Kodak within the logo, but you'll instantly, um, you know, get a clue of what it is and it's just the brand's identity is there. So the color is really important. Um, if we look at the, uh, some facts here on, on color, uh, people do make a lot of conscious decisions and uh, judgments about their environment and the products within the first 90 seconds of initial viewing. So the color of uh, what you see, it improves the brand recognition substantially and it increases comprehension and it makes you read the, uh, the advertisement more often. The impression that it makes is more memorable. So the impact of color is, is really uh, substantial. Looking at a, uh, a grocery store or places where you see products like uh, um, what you see in the shelves here, uh, products being put together, stacked together, uh, it, it instantly triggers something in the minds of the, uh, of the shopper. Um, there's the presence of color, it represents the brand. And when you look at a stack of products there, you will, um, value the, the color aspect also in the sense that imagine that there is one or two uh, products in on the shelf there that don't quite match the color as it should be, or there's a difference between certain boxes there. It instantly gives you a question mark. So it's uh, diverting you, it's, it's uh, confusing you, um, which is really not what the uh, vendor wants, what the brand wants you to do. They want to uh, attract your attention and uh, give you great confidence to uh, to purchase the product. Uh, for instance, the Coca-Cola brand, when they are um, looking for printers and um, to have them print their bottles, their their tin cans, their uh, shrink wrap labels, etc., they specify a certain delta E2000 tolerance of two. Uh, if you, as a print printer, cannot uh, deliver this time after time. Um, you will have a problem there to uh, to, to produce for Coca-Cola. So how do we uh, manage the process to get the color? Um, how do we manage all this to get the color right? And that's all about the, the color management. 
looking at this from a perspective of someone in production, print production, you may want to look and ask yourself, you know, what do I want to achieve? How do I want to print this with? And uh, who do I want to print this with better? And uh, how will I get there? But in, in the world of design, creating things, uh, it, it works quite different, right? Um, the color management there, uh, you start with uh, open skies and open mind. You start to look for uh, creative things. You, uh, you uh, look with uh, new perspectives and you want to have some innovative results. You want to be creative, right? So the color management is there also a foundation for building your designs. Um, let's have a look here at how you would um, start to uh, create a good environment or what the environment is like when you do the design. Uh, typical uh, components of a design studio, you have there a monitor display, you have the environment, and you have the application. So all three of them, they are substantially uh, contributing to the effect that the perceived color has. So the color you see there when you are being creative and you design th certain things, all three, the display, the environment, the application, the application settings, uh, they, they matter, they are uh, very influential. The um, time you spend on your design is, uh, you know, most of the time there is for, uh, for looking at your monitor screen and, and creating your your uh, designs. So there's a lot of time spent there and the minimum that you should do uh, is, is do a good monitor calibration. Um, there is various solutions on the market um, that all have their pluses and minuses, I guess, but uh, as a minimum, you should do this with an instrument. You know, do not rely on just your eyeball to calibrate this monitor screen, use instruments to measure and create uh, a calibration for this monitor screen. So uh, as the most basic, it will uh, make sure that your, uh, your workstation, the place where you design, will be uh, giving you the same color every time, each time you go to your, uh, to your design station. There are more high-end soft proofing systems and they go a bit further. Uh, very often they they include uh, setups where you have a monitor screen and you have some uh, real world prints uh, or samples uh, next to it that you compare against. Um, that's something we'll talk about later, um, but let's have a closer look at what is on the table here. So you see there's these two monitor screens, uh, the tabletop uh, viewing booth better and, and the one monitor screen. Um, that's all contributing to the environment and the environment, the surroundings, they do have a substantial effect on what you see on your monitor screen. Um, the uh, light temperature affects color. So you see here a row from left to right, something more warm to more neutral in the middle. And on the right hand side, you see this cold blue light. So different lights has different spectral characteristics, so different color effects. And the halogen and incandescent lights, uh, they are really not so much in fashion anymore with the energy sensitive days today, but they have quite a nice warm glow. And compare this to daylight in general, which is cooler and bluer. So the color that you will see is affected of course by the light that hits the object and then bounces back into your eye. So different light means you see different colors. Um, that's all very important, of course, and specifically if you're dealing with uh, printed samples. Um, but um, we are focusing now a bit on the design stage where what you do is mostly looking at your monitor screen. Uh, so surroundings and monitor screens, well, the surrounds uh, is affecting, of course, the color you perceive. Look at the cube here. This cube has uh, a uh, blue colored circle in the middle on, on three sides there. And just by looking there, of course, you see that all three are, are, are not the same. And that's okay because, uh, well, we're basically all humans and that's the trick that our brain plays with us. 
Um, if you would uh, isolate them, you will see that essentially they are the same. So there is quite an influence of the surroundings and this happens all the time everywhere. There's actually no way to, to uh, disable this, right? Um, if I would click again here, you'll see that uh, adding the surroundings back again, how the uh, color appearance, how it, the impression you have changes again because of the surroundings there and, and everything you have. So that's not to say that you should be working in a design studio that is very, uh, you know, very uh, controlled in the sense that you have a completely gray environment and that it's all uh, extremely tightly uh, set up. But um, monitor calibration is important, of course, and the surroundings, they all matter, the surroundings around your monitor screen, but also think about when you design something, the effect of the uh, surrounding colors. Looking at a print production, uh, as you can see here, there is also monitor screens to uh, to verify color or uh, to compare the um, printed samples to what you have on the monitor screen. Uh, that is typically done under strict conditions, uh, which is, for instance, the 5000 Kelvin, uh, which is based on a cloudy noon daylight. Uh, but that's very strict conditions there. And so that would be a good uh, target for you to work to as well, unless you say that the only uh, way that people will uh, view the uh, the artwork is in a grocery store where there is uh, totally different viewing conditions, then you may want to adjust for those as well. Going into some more uh, precise technical uh, situation here and, and um, how to manage a triangle, I named it. So there is the viewing conditions, there's the measurement condition, there's print conditions. And all three um, are defined in industry standards, ISO standards. The um, ISO standards, they evolve through the years and you should keep them synchronized um, at all times. Uh, you should never uh, mix um, those uh, conditions. Uh, looking here at the table, for instance, at the top, I mentioned two uh, print specifications. There is the older FOGRA 39 print specification for sheet fed offset on coated paper type, which is now actually uh, replaced by the FOGRA 51. Uh, or for the same story, you have the Grecal 2006 coated which is now the uh, Grecal 2013 CRPC-6. CRPC stands for Characterized Reference Print Condition number six. So looking at the uh, table underneath, you have the viewing conditions, the old ISO 3664 versus the new one. Yeah, there is quite a difference. If you would buy new uh, light tubes, they will be compliant, they will be conformed to the new ISO standard, right? I don't think there's vendors still selling the old tubes. The measurement conditions, um, in the past, uh, it was uh, what, it, what was uh, known as the unfiltered measurement condition. Today, it's, uh, it will be classified as M0. Um, so, but today it is a uh, different measurement condition is called M1, measurement, measurement condition number one, part of this ISO standard, which uh, the uh, measurement condition which will allow uh, the influence of the uh, optical brightness that you have in your, in your substrate. So a light source with a substantial amount of uh, UV waves and then the uh, fluorescence taking place because of the optical brightness in your substrate. Looking at the bottom of the table, there is the proven print conditions. The proof conditions, they also have changed. The, the ISO 12647 ISO standard is probably uh, one of the best known um, ISO standards for print. So the dash seven from the year 2007 was about uh, proofing, hard copy proofing. Uh, it's been replaced, it's now the uh, version uh, from the year 2016, different uh, criteria, different tolerancing as well. And that goes together with the print conditions, the uh, dash two, 
of the ISO 12647. There's the older one from the year 2007, and then there's the current from the year 2013. So if you would be working under the conditions of the current ISO standard, which is really the way to go, you would have your specific viewing conditions, your measurement conditions, and proof and print conditions all lined up to the new standard, which is, you know, print production would, for instance, be photograph 51 or sheet fed offset coded, or also the uh, Grecol 2013 CRPC 6. So it's it's all a matter of managing the triangle and making sure that viewing, measurement, proof, print conditions, they're all aligned, they're all synchronized. One last word here at the bottom of the slide, I mentioned that you should really pay good attention with uh, spot colors, specifically if you're designing something and you start out with a spot color. So a spot color named color, a Pantone or any other uh, brand color. Um, spot colors, they have an alternative, an, an alternative uh, color specification, which can be uh, LAB or it can be a CMYK. In case it's LAB and you want to transform your spot color into CMYK, process color CMYK, then you need to be really careful because the spot color will be transformed, for instance, into a FOGRA 51, which assumes that it's M1 measurement conditions. So the LAB specification of your spot color also has to be the uh, LAB definition under M1 measurement condition. If not, you're mixing things that don't belong together. Yeah? So the LAB value that you use as a definition for your spot to transform it to a CMYK process color has to match the ICC profile that you're using there to convert to a FOGA 51 or a CRPC 6. ICC profiles is one of those essential components when working, when doing the color management. Um, Looking here at this slide, you see the dominoes, uh, very well known uh, game. Pretty much everyone knows the, the game, can play the game, knows the rules. And it's, it's really a fairly simple, straightforward game. Um, there isn't um, too much to know about this. There is uh, obviously the domino matching game here. Uh, you're laying down dominoes end to end and uh, touching ends, they must match. That's how you build a chain. And you know, if someone playing the game doesn't have the right domino to put, then the game is blocked. Working with ICC profiles, in a way, there is quite a, sim quite a lot of similarity. Yeah? The, uh, you specify color unambiguously when you create. So when you create your artwork, you will create something within a CMYK or RGB space, or you work with certain spot colors. But if if you work in a certain RGB or CMYK space, it's not just any RGB or CMYK. It is unambiguously defined by the working space by an ICC profile. So what you do there is actually you put down the first domino of the chain you're about to build. And it's a very important choice, choice to make. You know? If the first chain of the, the, sorry, the first domino of the chain isn't there or is the wrong one, then, well, we can all uh, know what the result will be at the at the end of the chain. The uh, profile connection space, the PCS, that is uh, expressed in CLAP or CIEXYZ, um, so it acts like an Esperanto to connect to ICC device profiles. The ICC device profile, so think about dominoes and putting them together, they connect, you know, where they, uh, you know, talk the same language. That's the uh, profile connection space. So it's through the connection space that you connect to profiles that allows you to go from an RGB profile to a CMYK profile. They connect over the connection space, the PCS. So that allows you to go from an RGB to a CMYK or from one RGB to another RGB do all those things. So ICC device link profiles, they go between device dependent color uh, specifications, for instance, CMYK to CMYK, that's a four to four. Think about a domino that goes four to four, you know, that is a device link profile, an ICC device link profile. Uh, can also be used as certain advantages here and there. So when the um, 
ICC device profile is missing for an object within a PDF that you create. So it's like an undefined, from a color point of view, it's an undefined object. Then the, you know, the next one in line that continues with your work or starts processing your work, they will need some kind of a fallback. You know, the domino is missing. Where do I start from? Uh, and that is uh, a fallback provided by your uh, application. Uh, specifically the, the preference settings of your copy of the application. So that's not very well defined. That is, you know, up to what happens in the other application, the receiving end, if you want. Now, such unspecified color, really, it cannot happen with the uh, PDFX4 or with the Gantt Workgroup 2015 files. The uh, Gantt Workgroup 2015 specification, which is based on PDFX4, um, requires that all the objects within the PDF X, they are unambiguously defined in terms of color. There, there is no guesswork. You know, if there is an RGB picture, then there will be an ICC profile. If there is a CMYK object, then it will be clearly identified to be one or the other specific CMYK. So, think about these dominoes, think about the chain you build, think about the importance to start out when you create something, to start with the right ICC profile for your environment. Um, so you see on your monitor screen, um, your artwork, the way you intended it to be. And then from there, you start to go elsewhere um, to other applications, to other uh, uh, co-workers, to different workflows, etc., etc. The Ghent Work Group made a excellent document. Um, when the Ghent Work Group 2015, 2015 specification was released, there was also a PDFX workflow document. And this is a must have document. I give you the link there where you can uh, uh, browse to and download the PDF. It's um, it's really a very good reference document. It, um, it explains you step by step what the differences are in your workflow uh, when you're working to various specifications. The Ghent Work Group has had the uh, 1v4 specification for many, many years, um, and it's based upon the PDFX 1A um, standard. There's the Ghent Work Group 2015, which really is the thing to use now, and there's also there. Um, two flavors if you want to, strictly all CMYK or CMYK with a spot or CMYK with RGB and spots. So please download the document and take advantage of all these uh, new specifications and explanations in there. It really will guide you uh, from the stages of artwork design all the way to layout and the PDF creation, right? So looking at what resources you can find on the Ghent Work Group website, uh, there is, for instance, also all the application settings. Um, I take the example here of the uh, Adobe Creative Cloud. Um, you, you will find there the uh, CSF file, as they call it, for the Creative Cloud. And the CSF file, really what it is, it's a uh, it's a preference setting that you can um, open up in your uh, Adobe Bridge software and define it there, have it there, and it ripples down to your uh, Photoshop, Illustrator, InDesign application. It holds a number of things, these uh, CSF files. It will make sure that the uh, color settings in terms of ICC color profiles are uh, synchronized between the various applications. But it's, it's more than just the profile, it's also the policy behind it. You know, what do you do with uh, those profiles, um, certain settings for converting uh, the uh, pictures or whatever it is uh, from one color space to the other. So it's also about the policy. This will ensure that everything is synchronized and it's, uh, you know, like a first step to uh, set up your environment. Opening up a picture in Photoshop. When opening up a picture in Photoshop, 
and there is an embedded profile, then the general advice is to use that embedded profile. It's like encountering a person, the person gives you a business card that, ident that will identify the person. It tells you the name of the person, the language that he probably talks, the contact details. It's a description of the person. If you are receiving a picture here, you open it up in Photoshop and there is an IC profile embedded, you know, use it. It identifies what this RGB or CMYK picture really means in terms of color, LAB color, device independent color. Um, using that profile is essential. It might be different from your preference settings, but that's okay. So when you have this picture opened up in Photoshop, you can um, work on the picture, obviously, do many things, um, but you could also go, by the way, into a uh, soft proofing where you simulate um, how the picture will look like if you would convert this to a certain CMYK. So that's like a soft proofing, a preview, right? The pixels in the image don't change. They are still RGB with the original profile assigned to it, but you do a soft proofing to your monitor screen. When opening up, when opening up a picture um, and it comes with a profile, then that's to be used. If the profile is missing or what you see on your monitor screen is really very doubtful, you may want to assign yourself a different profile. And that's your own judgment. On your monitor screen, look at you know the result there and decide if it should be another ICC profile that's to be assigned to it. The pixels don't change, you just assign a different name tag, a different business card to the person because the previous one was wrong or it was missing. So again, your whole studio setup, your environment, your calibration of the monitor screen, it all matters when you take those decisions to assign a certain RGB profile. Remember, it's the first domino in your chain. It's really essential. What we have here is working on an RGB with a profile and this is what is referred to in the uh, Ghent Workgroup um, PDFX workflow document. It's been referred to as the media neutral imaging editing. So I am editing here in RGB, it's media neutral. I'm not doing any specific tweaks because it will be printed in on an offset press, uh, sheet fed or web or a flexo press or a digital. I'm not in, you know, deciding on the outputs. It's, neutral for the media I will be using for final production. Yeah, so this is media neutral editing. If we go to the next slide, yes, this one here, that's the process specific or the classic imaging editing. And what it is, is that you start out with the uh, RGB that needs to be converted to CMYK. Looking at the CMYK there, um, you will see that um, there are a lot of constraints because you convert to the CMYK, the color space typically is being reduced. Um, this is going to be process specific and um, you can, of course, while you're viewing all this here, modify certain settings. You may want to go specifically to a Grackle 2013 CRPC 6. You may want to have certain uh, changes of rendering intent or other settings, but that's because that's what you like and what you see on your monitor screen. Yeah, It's diverting from the general best practices, but this is because of specific for this uh, process, you as a creative uh, person decide that uh, it looks better this way or you intend it to be like this. Uh, that's an example for the Grackle, can be for an ISO coded as well. It's as you wish, right? So that's that's you as a creative person doing process specific uh, image evaluations of converting it to CMYK and deciding how it will appear. Isolated on your um, design station, but if you look here uh, for creative people, they typically work also with brand owners. There's a collaboration that is possible and that typically would go over the internet. So there is uh, 
solutions uh, like the product I've shown you here, the Kodak Insight Creative Workflow, uh, solutions where there is collaboration between creative people and brand owners to talk about certain pictures and logos, whatnot. Um, take the example of the picture here, which is RGB and is uh, kept as RGB. Um, so this is media neutral review. Everyone sees the same picture in RGB on their calibrated monitor screen over the internet as collaboration. But it could also be that you say, I have here a picture or a logo, whatever it is, and it is actually a PDFX. So what it is, you're viewing the artwork specific for a print condition, which is defined by the PDFX output intent. Right? We'll come back to the uh, PDFX output intent and what it all means, right? But it's all specific to a print condition. This is collaboration that involves more people versus the previous slides. It's more you isolated on your design, um, in your design studio on your workstation. Soft proofing, of course, very uh, important. Uh, very much in use. There is still possibilities, obviously, to do hard copy proofing as well, uh, typically to inkjet proofers. What you do with your artwork is you output it on your um, inkjet proofer, which then actually simulates the PDFX output intent, which is the print condition you specify um, for your artwork. The uh, the proof comes out, you better verify that the proof is really an accurate uh, proof, a contract proof, where the tolerances of, of the ISO standard are respected. So that's the 12647-7. Uh, the current one is the 2016 edition. There's color bars that you can use from uh, Idea Lines or from Fogra that go together with all these uh, standards. Um, so there is hard copy proofing. The original artwork could still contain RGB pictures, bitmap pictures, and there can be spot colors, there can be a CMYK object as well in the PDFX, but they all go through the uh, PDFX output intent to simulate this print condition of the output intent onto the Epson proofer or whatever inkjet proofer it is, right? So, Going through the output intent is really an essential mechanism of the PDFX. Looking here at uh, various color specifications, right? So in your um, in your artwork, there can be uh, various objects, and objects have several, uh, or each object has a specific um, color specification. It can be device gray, so gray scale. Uh, without any uh, ICC profile. It can be ICC-based CMYK, so CMYK with an ICC profile. ICC-based RGB, so an RGB object with an ICC profile. It can be LAB, it can be Cal RGB, calibrated RGB, or device CMYK, so plain CMYK without a profile. Each object has its own color specification. Um, the color specification of all these objects, they will go via the prof profile connection space towards the output intent. And the output intent is the, C the CMYK space of the intended print condition. Yeah, so it goes via the LAB connection space to the output intent CMYK space, and then onwards to your um, the uh, output device, like a display or a printer. Yeah, that's the rendering process that you have there. I have two important remarks there. And the first one is ICC-based CMYK, which is not allowed in um, by the Gantwer Group 2015 specifications. So that would be CMYK with an embedded ICC profile. That is not allowed. All the CMYKs within a PDFX have to be uh, device CMYK. So CMYK without a profile, um, the other comment there is that uh, ICC-based RGB as well as Cal RGB and LAB, which is only really allowed for bitmap pictures. So eight or 16-bit uh, bit 
bitmap pictures, images, uh, at least for the Ghent Workgroup 2015. Yeah. The uh, PDF-X4 uh, ISO standard, which is the basis for the Ghent Workgroup 2015, that uh, PDF-X ISO standard is allowing ICC-based CMYK and uh, ICC-based RGB also for other things than bitmap images, but the Ghent Workgroup is more constrained. Yeah, because we are more, well, we are really uh, print-centric and um, it, it really has to work for the entire production chain. You are advised to uh, verify the Ghent Group variants. So the Ghent Group specification has various variants for uh, specific uh, uh, printing, uh, print conditions. And uh, as part of it, there are certain permissible color specifications. Uh, there are Ghent Workgroup uh, specifications that allow RGB pictures, others that don't. Yeah, so there is um, to be uh, take that has to be taken into account. So color through the funnel that's happening that that, that happens from all the objects within the PDF uh, through the output intent and then onwards to the raster output device like your display or printer. The output intent CMYK. That is the next slide here. So if we would have a look at the PDFX output intent um, for the in intended print condition, that is um, in the case of Ghent Work Group, the PDFX we have, they are the, the PDFX is for blind exchange. So everything is included. Uh, fonts are there, pictures are there, but also the ICC profiles are there. The output intent is like, well, it actually is an ICC device profile. It's it's written like in the header of the PDF in, uh, and it, it signifies the print condition that this document is uh, meant to be uh, simulating. For a multi-page document, you have only one output intent. So all pages, they are designed for one and the same print condition. The upcoming PDF X6 will allow per page a different output intent. So imagine you have a multi-page PDF document, PDFX, which is a PDFX 6, then you could have, for instance, four pages cover and then 32 pages content, and the cover and the content pages, they will go to different print conditions and consequently have different output intents. That will be something for the, for the not too far future. Device CMYK objects, they are they are already in the color space of the output intent. So when the when those colors go through the funnel, there is actually no transformation. They are already in the intended um, color space. The output intent is page level blending color space of the transparency groups. So um, I see here a device CMYK object, an ICC-based RGB, which is sRGB, an ICC-based, which is pro photo RGB. So three objects there on, on the page and they're all isolated. They're not interacting. Um, each uh, object has a clear color specification. But what happens if I start to use transparency to, transparency to blend them together? You know, blending objects, they blend into a blend space, which is CMYK. So transparency blend spaces, the Ghent Work Group requires that the blend spaces, so the place where the various objects blend together, where they fuse together, there has to be device CMYK. And the, the output intent is the page level blending color space of transparency groups. So the output intent, your, you know, PSO coded V3 profile, uh, which could be the output intent. Um, that is a CMYK print condition. So that is also the CMYK space in which all your uh, objects will blend. Very careful for um, creating new artwork, creating new documents is when you start creating the file is the choice of what you're going to be creating there. Will it be for mobile or web or will it be for print? If it will be for mobile devices or web, then the blending space will be defined in RGB. However, for print, it has to be CMYK. So really pay good attention there that what you create is specified to be for print. If you'd make a mistake and you start up with uh, a new document that is for mobile or web, so it blends in RGB and then 
you discover that the mistake is there and you can go into the uh, settings of your software and change the blend the blend space uh, change it from rgb to cmyk there is a possibility however be extremely careful because as you see the picture down below you see the uh, lighter waves there on the left hand side that actually disappear on the right hand side that's just that on the left hand side the objects they were blending in rgb so they show as intended however if you change the setting from blending in rgb to blending in cmyk you know the picture could disappear or anyway seriously change so it's very careful with this here blending in cmyk so a transparency group of a uh, number of device cmyk objects so you see at the top there is the orange and the red objects both are just plain cmyk no icc profiles uh, they blend together into the cmyk blend space so at the bottom you see some examples there's actually 16 blend space a uh, blend modes sorry so ways to um, blend them together i put there uh, four out of the 16 difference overlay hue luminosity so the uh if the orange colored would be the the backdrops the one behind and then the red one partially on top of the uh, backdrop um, there is an interaction between the two objects they blend together they give you a visual impression like there is a third object uh, although it isn't there it's just uh, the way transparency works yeah like in difference you see there's a black box in the middle etc so that is the blending that happens uh, of the two objects and you uh, can creatively choose your blend mode and uh, design as you wish uh, but they blend in cmyk if you go on the next slide where uh, it's very similar however the uh, two objects one is cmyk and the other one is rgb so of course cmyk in this case here it's a uh, device CMYK without a profile, the, R, the ICC profile is there for the RGB object. They will blend in CMYK. So what needs to happen first with the ICC based RGB object is that it goes from the RGB space into a CMYK, the blend space, and then the two objects, they can blend together. Yeah. Think about the dominoes. If the first domino would be missing so the icc based rgb would not be icc based but just a regular plain device rgb so without a profile then you have a serious problem there it would be very much dependent on the preferences of your copy of the software you're using the settings in there so that's very inconsistent so putting the profile there working with icc based that's of course the goal uh, the the way to go if this would have been a PDFX, then of course RGB will have the ICC profiles. You will be in a safe environment uh, where everything works uh, as it's intended to be, very consistently. Um, nesting transparency groups is of course allowed by the PDFX4 standard, but also of course by the Gantwer group specifications. When creating a document for instance in indesign and you combine a logo that came from indesign uh, from illustrator or from with with pictures from from photoshop you create your artwork in um, your document in indesign you have to be really careful because within indesign you can create transparency groups and you can combine various objects that you were placing importing into your document if the documents into which you uh, are importing your uh, your logos for instance or pictures the document will obviously blend in cmyk but if the object that you import blends in rgb you don't you don't instantly get an alert um, but uh, you create there a construction which is a combination of blending in rgb and blending in cmyk right and this is not okay this is not supported not allowed by the Gantt work group 2015 specification it has to blend in cmyk so be careful with uh, files you import and place into for instance in design uh, if they contain transparency make sure they blend by themselves in um, cmyk 
more good news from the Ghent Work Group. There are excellent tools um, when working in uh, Adobe InDesign, for instance. Uh, there is the uh, pre-flight pre-flight settings. So again, go to the application settings on the uh, Ghent Work Group website, and you find the live pre-flight. Uh, settings. Live pre-flighting is a standard feature of the Adobe InDesign software. It's there, yet um, you will have to populate it yourself with the right pre-flight profiles, the right settings. And that's exactly the settings you get from the Gantt Workgroup website. There are various uh, pre-flight settings there, dependent on the uh, market segment you're working for, uh, the so-called variants. When the uh, pre-flighting is running live in your copy of InDesign, so when you're creating things, importing, placing things in the document, you instantly have the pre-flight running and alerting you if there is something questionable, something that's not quite right and needs to be taken care of. Um, it's the traffic lights, the green is a pass, so everything is still okay. If it's red, it's an error. There is no orange light here for warnings, but uh, this really is a very useful thing because you know when you create that there is something going on. That's the creation of your file. And then once you have it there, you can export. There are export settings that come also with the, uh, from the same download link there with the application settings. There are uh, export settings to create a good PDFX4 file. Uh, but then specific for the Ghent Work Group 2015. There's the various variants. There is the uh, uh, flavor where it's all CMYK or there's the flavor where it's um, CMYK and RGB is allowed. There's different flavors for different resolutions. You know, uh, there there's a, a great number of uh, files to choose from for your specific uh, print, uh, print situation. Those are for Adobe uh, InDesign and uh, other Adobe products. Quark has uh, similar settings. You can also find those at the uh, application setting uh, page on our Gantt Work Group uh, website. So for Quark, um, there's uh, similar settings, similar mechanisms that do apply. So that's the way you can create your excellent files ready for print production and uh, even if you have created your files the correct way, um, there is still uh, value in doing pre-flighting. Pre-flighting um, for all the uh, Gantt Work Group variants, of course, per market segment, uh, you can find those pre-flight settings within your copy of um, Adobe Acrobat Pro. There is the Kalos PDF toolbox that has them. There is the Unfocus software that does it. Um, those are more standalone uh, boxes. There is also workflow solutions, many of them in the market, um, like the Kodak Print Energy workflow includes pre-flight settings that uh, will check your files, uh, check but also uh, fix files if there's something wrong with them, all in uh, in conformance to what the uh, Ghent Work Group 2015 specification tells you. Um, we are going to the end of the presentation here. Yes, I see there's a few more slides. Um, so the pre-flighting, um, even if you did everything upstream correctly, pre-flighting is of course still very important. Uh, there is a number of checks and fixes that can be done in here that aren't always available in the uh, other applications upstream, right? Nine very good reasons to pre-flight, nine reasons, that's uh, the title of the poster here. Uh, obviously, there are many more good reasons to pre-flight, but uh, we've put together this poster and some uh, explanation that goes with it. Um, Nine reasons listed here, image resolution, unintended RGB, spot colors, font issues, white text, deep black, transparency issues, layers, blending color spaces, um, and so on and so forth. Uh, a very good reference, something that can be uh, 
used in, in many, uh, many situations. If as a print buyer or a creative person working with uh, printers, um, you would want to check how their RIP settings are configured, how their workflow is configured, or in general, is the workflow or is the RIP capable to process those PDFX files correctly, those Gantt workgroup uh, uh, PDFX4 files, will they process correctly? So there is a seriously impressive uh, test suite created by the Gantt workgroup. We are now at version five and uh, there is various pages, six pages, if I'm not mistaken here, yes. Uh, some are uh, entirely CYK, others include uh, spot colors, and there's also some more with uh, CMS, so with ICC-based uh, uh, objects and uh, color specifications. Um, it's fairly intuitive to use. It uh, doesn't take uh, much to understand if it's a pass or fail. It's really intuitive, it's a clear indication. If you would go to the website, you will find this um, test suite, but you will also find um, there or from the RIP and workflow vendors, you will find the advice settings for how to process this onto a certain workflow or RIP and how to configure those uh, workflows and RIPs and what uh, software version the workflow or the RIP should be at in order to process this file correctly. Right, so strongly advised, uh, maybe not so much for uh, people doing uh, artwork, artwork creation, unless they are working closely together with printers, um, maybe something more for print buyers and uh, other interested parties. In summary, yes, we all know color matters from the uh, creation of the artwork and the PDFX files all the way to print. I hope you understand the uh, importance to set up your color the way you should on your uh, desktop. Uh, so you get color in a very repeatable way and you can uh, work as it should, create as, as you should, you know, consistently. Uh, so you can decide what it is you want when you create, when you uh, collaborate with others, when you communicate with others uh, between designers and uh, brand owners, print buyers. Uh, there is a lot of communication going on there between various parties and PDFX, the X stands for exchange. And what we do with the Ghent work group is the blind exchange, only the blind exchange. So it's a PDF X4, which is uh, even more constrained than what the ISO uh, tells you to do for a PDF X4 file. Um, it's blind exchange, so it includes all you need to know in order to communicate uh, in a very accurate way and uh, get the result you're looking for. So I came here to the end of my presentation and you will find here the my contact details in case you would need to find me. You can obviously always contact the Ghent work group as well. I would like to thank you for your uh, attendance and um, interest. Let's uh, have a look with the uh, Carol, who's the minister for this uh, Ghent work group event. If there is any questions that came up, any uh, things that need to be clarified. Yeah, so if you are within uh, InDesign, for instance, your layout application, and you have their various RGBs uh, positioned on the page, and there are RGBs from different sources, but you're not quite sure uh, where they came from and they don't carry an ICC profile with them, then yes, you have a problem there. There is a default mechanism within InDesign that uh, it will show you this RGB on your monitor screen using the preference settings. 
but that's the preference settings of your copy of InDesign. Um, and that's basically your guess or your, your uh, policy to work with a certain profile. The better thing would be that you uh, ask yourself where the RGB picture came from and what profile should be there. Within InDesign, you can assign yourself specific profiles to pictures, uh, or you could, uh, you know, go back to the original artwork, the original picture, open it up in Photoshop, and see which profile is making most sense for the picture. It takes a lot of time if you do this manually, and your personal judgment, uh, but there are obviously default mechanisms in InDesign if there is various RGBs from various sources. If some of them are undefined without a profile, it will use the settings from the preferences. When you export as a PDFX for Ghent Workgroup, the profile will be, there, will be there. The RGB will have a profile, but that's according to the policy of your export settings and the preferences. Yeah, which is maybe not to uh, what the original creation was uh, intended to look like. Yeah. So there is uh, there is ways, there is mechanisms. So yes, um, those were originally created by the VIGC. Uh, good work, of course, from the people at the VIGC. It's uh, a number of years old, that's true. Uh, there is no update available to this. However, you can obviously uh, change those um, change those settings to to work with uh, the current uh, state in terms of uh, color specifications. Uh, no longer with the uh, ISO coded V2, but rather with the PSO coded V3 or the uh, uh, Grackle uh, CRPC uh, settings of today. Uh, so you can modify those. Yeah. For RGB, I don't think it really matters so much, but it's specifically about the CMYK. That's what I think the question came from or is all about. If not, then uh, let us know uh, what it is you're looking for. All right, I um, thank you all very much. I thank the Ghent Work Group for giving me the podium here to uh, present and uh, wishing you all best of luck and uh, stay in touch. Thank you very much. Thank you.